guys. Is this on? Oh, it's on now. Okay. So this title, as you see, is Medieval Treaties and the Diplomatic Aesthetic. So in what I think is an important topic within the broader field of the visual culture of charters. Uh, now, what do I mean by diplomatic aesthetic and why is this important or significant? So my fundamental argument that I'm going to present to you today is that looking at the documents of diplomacy with an art historian's eyes can reveal an essential artistic dynamic at work. And this in turn can give us insight into both how diplomacy works and also into the mechanics of particular kinds of artistic practices. <coughs> So the first part of this talk will outline what I see as the general principle that I'm arguing here. And the second part of my talk will offer a few uh, illustrative examples that I'll take you through. And then I'll conclude by returning briefly to this general principle and uh, drawing out perhaps a few implications from the, from the specific to the general. So to outline my argument as to the general principle, I first need to back up and begin by thinking about how international law is understood and then how the kinds of artistic practices uh, are understood, that is, the kinds of artistic practices to which I, I believe this investigation is relevant. So a recent study of international law, um, this is Lowe's uh, international law, begins by illustrating two of the subject's fundamental questions, namely, why do states comply with international law and why should states comply with international law, with what the author describes as a domestic analogy. Suppose that I, he writes, as a university professor, lend a book to a student. The book is not returned, and I ask for it back. If it is still not returned, despite increasingly urgent informal requests, I might write to the student on university note paper. The shift into the university context increases my power, as against that of the student, and shifts, it in, uh, shifts in the context of the dispute in the factors and types of argument that are relevant and the relative power of me and the student have been affected uh, through the use of language. Sorry, so these shifts in power, he's saying, has been affected, have been affected through the use of language. If the student believes that the police are likely to tell me they have better things to do than chase after the books of socially dysfunctional professors, my threat to involve them will carry little weight. Nonetheless, it is by no means the case that the persuasive power of the law depends upon the immediate availability of some means of enforcement. So this scenario dramatizes what the author considers as a practice of illocution, this is uh, his word, and the fact that the invocation of the law can be a gentle and elusive process even in the midst of crisis. However, as I imagine you may have picked up from this description, um, from this domestic analogy, not all of the shifts uh, in power in this scenario are affected through the use of language, strictly speaking. In fact, the analogy begins with a visual example, the university note paper. This is far from an exceptional case. Visual and material culture often play a central role in encounters which, though they predate international law as such, share its salient feature of evoking authority in the absence of unambiguous sovereignty. Diplomatic relations in general, and treaties in particular, perennially involve the construction of authority through cultural forms, ceremonies, oaths, exchanges of gifts, which have performance, linguistic, visual, and material elements. So in some respects, my uh, investigation belongs also to, uh, to the cultural history of diplomacy, um, but particularly its visual culture. A number of recent studies have considered the connections between art and diplomacy, particularly on the one hand in the Byzantine Empire, in both the middle and late Byzantine eras, and also at, in a sort of separate strand of scholarship in 16th and 17th century Western Europe. And these discussions concentrate mainly on the work of art as a diplomatic gift. Uh, and this uh, particularly sort of splendid example um, is part of the sort of the strand of scholarship that talks about uh, Byzantine manuscripts as luxury gifts, or luxury manuscripts rather, as diplomatic gifts from Byzantium to the West, which was written about uh, by John Loudon uh, in uh, 92, I believe, wonderful article, and then more recently in a book by Cecily Hillsdale. And this, uh, this manuscript, which was given uh, to Saint-Denis by Manuel Pelagos in 1408, is now in the Louvre. Um, and in an interesting coincidence, this painting is also in the Louvre, which has also been written about recently, 
completely separately as a uh, work of art functioning as a diplomatic gift by uh, Tracy Sowerby in her discussion of the role of portraiture in early modern diplomacy. Um, so this is a portrait of Edward VI that was sent to the French court in 1551 uh, as part of uh, marriage negotiations. So in addition to the idea of the work of art as a diplomatic gift, uh, some of these scholarly investigations uh, have talked about other kinds of interaction, such as staged encounters with architecture and landscape. Uh, for example, um, one wonderful example, I think, the garden tours of Versailles for visiting diplomats from Spain, Russia, Morocco, Algeria, Siam, Genoa, and Tripoli. Um, these were in the, the later 17th and very early 18th century. And here is a depiction of this, uh, the Siamese delegation in, this, in 1686 to uh, France. And then this uh, roundel here, oh, sorry, sorry, this one here, which I've enlarged, shows them being uh, sort of overwhelmed by the display of the, the gardens of Versailles. So the authors of these studies that I've just been discussing often situate their examinations within a framework of cross-cultural exchange uh, and evoke or critique anthropological frameworks of gift giving or literary theories of reception. It is a strand of scholarship that complements and in some more recent cases draws from the, what's called the new diplomatic history as advocated by John Watkins, uh, who coined the phrase, who has called for a, a multidisciplinary reevaluation of one of the oldest and traditionally one of the most conservative subfields in the modern discipline of history, the study of pre-modern diplomacy. So several of these studies in uh, Byzantine and also in early modern art address similar themes. They often focus on portraiture, broadly defined, as both of the examples I showed you are, are, are actually absolutely typical in this regard. And in an interesting parallel between at least two unrelated studies, uh, they also often evoke the idea of decline, um, specifically of the adaptive power of cultural currency in inverse correlation to waning military and political control. A more charged version of the uh, elusive process that I referred to earlier, and what we might now call soft power. Right? Above all, the authors who have written about art and diplomacy, along with uh, more directly historical exponents of new diplomatic history, either explicitly or implicitly embrace the idea of diplomacy as an expanded field. An analogy springs to mind with uh, studies of popular piety in quotes, I should probably say, uh, that embrace a broad definition of the liturgical. Uh, just as there's more to the liturgy than the Eucharist, there's more to diplomacy than treaties. So what I want to suggest is that there is also more to treaties than treaties. In other words, even such central instruments of diplomacy as letters of procuration, treaties, and treaty ratifications have elusive and symbolic elements and even these most canonical sources of diplomatic history are also part of cultural history. One can also see them as the nuclei of spectacular ceremonies, the permanent fragments of a larger lost performance. The picture I'm showing you here is actually the 1957 Treaty of Rome. Uh, so a modern example, but as you can see, there's a um, strong visual culture element. Um, in a uh, older example, closer to the material I'm talking about, uh, there's an account of, uh, that I think is very eloquent actually, an account of the Russian ambassador's 1662 delegation to London, which I think paints a very vivid picture of the way in which uh, documents were one part of a kind of a total work of art, one might say. Um, here we go, okay, so the ambassador, the Russian ambassador's retinue, with their caps of fur, tunics, richly embroidered with gold and pearls, made a glorious show. The king being seated under a canopy in the banqueting house, the secretary of the embassy went before the ambassador in a grave march, holding up his master's letters of credence and a crimson taffeta scarf before his forehead. The ambassador then delivered it with a profound reverence to the king, who gave it to our secretary of state. It was written in a long and lofty style. Then came in the presents borne by 165 of his retinue. These borne by so long a train rendered it very extraordinary. Wind music played all the while in the galleries above. 
So the period I'm going to be talking about today is from about 1200 to about 1475, with two principal examples drawn from the 14th and early 15th centuries. And the broader source base of my research is diplomatic correspondence, um, but specifically treaty ratifications. So just a word to the art historians among you, uh, a sort of caveat, or maybe it's more of an apologia, actually. Um, this is not the great golden age for treaties as a vehicle for artistic splendor. Um, and that would be from roughly the early 16th to the mid 17th century. So here is the uh, obverse of the golden seal that uh, was validated or partially validated the ratification of the Treaty of Amiens in 1527. And uh, here is the 1605 uh, Spanish side ratification of the Treaty of London. Um, and I've spoken about these elsewhere, so I, they are not, uh, they're certainly interesting and important, but I, I want to talk about the documents that I'm speaking about today for a particular reason. So the documents from this period are certainly less spectacular, but what their visual analysis allows me to excavate and show you is an underlying theoretical principle which has much wider implications. And I also wanted to speak about this today. I suppose I should uh, emphasize a particular occasional reason, which is that uh, one of the things that I love so much about the BAA is the way in which I've heard so many talks that many of you have given that have really excavated for me sort of spectacular visual worlds from not that much that necessarily survives. So this is my gift exchange, as it were, uh, to you. Uh, so this era, the sort of 13th and 14th into the 15th centuries, is hugely significant because this period marks the stage when the textual, visual, and material conventions of charter production had been firmly established in the chanceries across Europe. So they'd really worked out a system. Um, and this example I'm showing you is a diploma of uh, Philip Augustus. It's uh, 1202, um, and here it's a bit hard to see the details of the seal from the photograph, so this is a cast, so you can see what that, that would look like. Um, so chanceries across Europe shared some, but by no means all of these conventions. And this gets to the central issue of sovereignty, which is, as we all know, a problematic word and concept, even for the analysis of modern nation states. The vast majority of charters produced by a chancery of central government are instruments of domestic sovereignty. They project authority and therefore are able to exert control in a way that is above all visual and material. The text is of course important, but the text alone does not an authentic charter make. The more conventional and recognizable these visual aspects are, the better they work. Uh, the documents of diplomacy demand the creation of a charter with recognizable authenticity and authority in two contexts, often with very different conventions. So how do you do this? Documents that cross contemporary jurisdictions differ from domestic documents in their form as well as their purpose. The creators of diplomatic documents needed to fashion charters that worked in the visual language of the recipient as well as their own. Often to address recipients of equal or higher status rather than the sigillant's own subjects, such as the uh, <coughs> French charter I showed you a moment ago. And finally, the documents of diplomacy need to evoke authority beyond the sigillant's own jurisdiction. Their brief required discrimination among those aspects of a charter that had local as opposed to universal force, but also those that relate specifically to the exercise of executive power as opposed to the act of communication. So what emerges seems to be different each time with respect to details, but with a structural commonality. The eventual document manifests a kind of visible negotiation, the struggle to achieve and realize an object with universal authenticity and authority. This universality, these varied and idiosyncratic attempts at a lingua franca of visual communication then become comprehensible as a group with a common goal. So treaty ratifications all look different, but if you look at them structurally, they're actually all trying to do the same thing. They're trying to achieve an aesthetic of universal authority that transcends the conventions of individual chanceries and cultures. So in the words of my title, a diplomatic aesthetic. So the discussion that follows in the second part of my talk is gonna concentrate particularly on treaty ratifications. Um, and I, the reason I've chosen this uh, particular type is that 
First, um, these are generally the most formal diplomatic documents. Uh, not always, but generally. And so they represent uh, Chancery's most significant efforts in diplomatic correspondence. And as highly valued and also reciprocal documents exchanged by the parties to the agreement, survival often allows a pair to be compared. My two case studies are, um, and I'll in, do them and take them in chronological order, so the ratification documents for the 1386 Treaty of Windsor uh, between England and Portugal, uh, which was ratified uh, the following year. Uh, here is the Portuguese ratification. And, uh, and then the next one I'll discuss uh, is the 1420 Treaty of Troyes. So diplomatic documents themselves are part of what I've described as this systematizing process that had really um, taken full effect by the 13th century. Um, so the, the process itself, I suppose I would say, had its own rule. Uh, so alongside related developments in administration, bureaucratic government, and representative diplomacy, a system for producing these kinds of documents themselves had been fairly firmly established. So treaty documents generally assumed a double nature. Um, articles of agreement, which were negotiated and sealed by representatives, uh, so representatives who'd been given full power to conclude the treaty, um, and ratifications sealed and exchanged by the parties, so the princes or uh, sort of principal sigillants of central government. So what I'm showing you here is the Articles of Agreement of the Treaty of Windsor, the 1386 Articles of Agreement. <coughs> this logistical standardization of, uh, uh, sorry, logistical, excuse me, logistical is a hard word to say. This logistical standardization of process, however, did not extend to a material standardization of its products. Treaty ratification documents themselves remained idiosyncratic, generated by the dynamics of their individual occasions. In the study of the material and visual character of medieval diplomatic documents as a discrete category, um, the most significant treatments, uh, just to sort of give you a bit of background if this is not your, um, if this is not your field, uh, the most significant tr treatments are generally, would generally uh, when we generally say are those of Pierre Chaplet, uh, as with so many things. Um, most relevant here, his remarkable and exhaustive English medieval diplomatic practice, and particularly the second volume of facsimiles and commentaries. Uh, Chaplet himself noted that the facsimile volume of his book uh, pays less attention to treaties than he would have wished, uh, given the difficulties involved in their reproduction. When he does discuss them, or their subsidiary documents, uh, and this is in his words, in describing the documents illustrated, especially those concerned with the negotiation and conclusion of treaties, particular attention has been paid to the formulae used and to the handwriting in an attempt to ascertain the part played by English and foreign clerks in the drafting and engrossing of the originals under consideration. So given the sort of frequently large size of treaty ratifications, so they're often larger than folio size, um, there were a number of photographic difficulties in including them, and these persist in the days of digital imaging. I mean, it's very, this is not the easiest thing to see in reproduction. Um, and uh, where, <laughs> where angels fear to tread, I am jumping right in to talk about them anyway, but I recognize that that's still an issue. Um, however, I'm not just uh, talking about something that Chaplet judged or wasn't able to talk about, I'm also going to explore another perspective in the formal analysis of diplomatic documents, uh, what one might call an interpretive rather than a deductive approach. Chaplet's efforts to deduce the choreography of a document's production, as he said, the part played by English and foreign clerks, equally extend to other elements of the document's physical description, such as sealing, seal attachment, and decoration. He aims to understand the practices, the very logistics of diplomacy, down to the very moments of when and where pen touched parchment and metal touched wax, the realities of human bodies in space. And to this end, he looks to untangle the roles of the representatives of each uh, communicating party. He therefore uses formal analysis as a diagnostic for a creator's origin. Conversely, one might also consider the expressive possibilities of choice, both formal and administrative. In the first case, scribes, artists, and authors often adopt foreign, or to them foreign, languages and conventions, 
both verbal and visual. This is evident from a diverse range of late medieval examples and is actually particularly well known in uh, art historical scholarship. Uh, there are examples of scribes from the uh, Netherlands working in England um, and uh, as a frequently discussed example is the Alhambra, so painters in, in Nosford, Granada, and the way in which sort of uh, different groups adopt different uh, vocabularies, stylistic vocabularies. So this is something I think that one can bring to discussion of documents as well. The creative imitation of, as it were, foreign styles can work across time as well as space, as perhaps even better known in both paleographical and art historical scholarship. In the second case, when creators did work in the conventions of their training, choice still plays a role in the administrative choice of personnel and organization. And both of these categories of choice have significant interpretive implications. Affirmative decisions to adopt particular forms or styles can convey meaning as part of the elusive process of diplomacy. And who did what suggests an understanding of the significance of different roles in the diplomatic process. In either case, the departure from routine chancery practices allows for the observation and interpretation of active choice. So some of the earliest extant treaty documents, um, quite a bit earlier than this actually, uh, take the form of chirographs. So that, that is to say, oh, sorry. Could you adjust the volume slightly? Oh, volume. Okay, uh, I'm not quite sure how to do that. I mean, I could just speak louder. Is that better, like this? Yes, yes okay. Oh, actually, I think part of it is microphone. Okay, can it, this better? Yes, okay, sure. Um, yes, okay, so some of the earliest ones take the form of chirographs, so indentures, to documents that are written twice, divided, and separated. Um, so examples are the surviving 12th century indentures recording alliances between England and Flanders. Late medieval treaty ratifications, such as this one, by contrast, generally follow the format of royal charters or letters patent, and so structurally they recall the more elevated public documents issued by central government to its subjects. The material nature of a chirograph suggests an occasion of mutual contact, even if a fictive one. The fact that its scribe writes two copies of the text on what is initially the same sheet reinforces the document's symbolic connection to presence and performance, to an oath taken in person in which both parties meet face to face. By contrast, later ratification documents suggest absence or rather presence through representation. Each party confirms the articles agreed by human representatives in a document, so th in which this is an example, here we see, where um, the party is represented by his seal or her seal, but in all these cases it's his seal. In the case of the Treaty of Windsor, ratifications both by the King of Portugal and the King of England survive along with the Articles of Agreement sealed by the two Portuguese proctors. Both Richard's ratification and Joao's appear, roughly speaking, as royal charters of confirmation. So that's the form that they would evoke to the people familiar with their own chancery conventions. Um, but both of them look very different from those typically uh, issued in their names. So Joao's in particular here looks unlike any document uh, issued by his chancery. So here's Portuguese ratification um, from uh, 1387. And here, uh, by way of an example, is a charter of privileges for the monastery of Alcobasa, uh, Cistercian monastery, which many of you may know, which was issued in 1389. So same chancery, almost exactly the same time. And as you can see there, you know, the heart could hardly be, well, they could be more different, but they're extremely different. Um, and here you can just compare the details that everything about the script and the format um, and, you know, the language even is also different. Uh, it's the Portuguese charter is in the vernacular and the ratification is in Latin. Um, so taking you back to the ratification again, so you can see. Um, in fact, one of the main principal reasons why it looks so bizarre from the point of view of Portuguese charters is that the charter itself was written in Richard's chancery. It was actually written in England. Um, and then it was notarized and sealed in Portugal before its return to England. So you can see here the notarial mark and uh, a, a um, detail of the seal, which is, uh, again, obviously, uh, different conventionally from an English seal uh, in that it's, uh, in, it's a lead bulla type seal. Um, I think it 
show you the full one again. Um, so the two charters uh, were therefore prepared under the same direction and therefore mirror each other in format. So here's Joao's again, and here's Richard's, okay? Um, now, at first glance, not surprisingly, given what I've just uh, told you, Richard's ratification looks more like a typical product of his chancery, uh, because it is, I mean, it is a product of his chancery, but it's not a typical one. Um, so it's written in a relatively constructed hand um, on parchment, uh, originally sealed with the great seal, uh, and attached on red and green braided cords with the name of the supervising clerk, whose name was Burton, uh, inscribed in the far lower right, which is very hard to see, but that's there. Um, so just by way of comparison, here is one of, uh, n I would say not quite typical or sort of more elaborate than average, but uh, still, at least in terms of its script and sealing and seal attachment, more typical charter of Richard's from uh, two years earlier, uh, which was uh, actually similarly, it's a, a document issued to a monastic or a conventional institution, the Priory of Hurley in Berkshire. Uh, so you can sort of see how it's, it's a bit more similar, but, um, but there are some important uh, differences. Um, so Richard's charter begins with the same language as an inspeximus charter, that is an inspection and confirmation charter, um, such as you know, he might issue to confirm a charter of one of his predecessors. Um, but with the peace treaty, uh, as uh, that, sorry, but, but the peace treaty is a confirmed document rather than a previous charter. Um, however, unlike a, a domestic, as it were, uh, confirmation charter, it ends with very unusual sealing and dating clauses, which I'll just read and then I'll, I'll explain them subsequently. So uh, the sealing clause, in cuius re testimonium presentes literas nostras in formam publici instrumenti, per notarium publicum infrascriptum fieri, et publicari mandavimus nostrique sigilli magni fecimus a pensione muniri. And it's dated in Palacio Nostro West Monasteri, vicesimo quarto die februari anno domini, millesimo, trecentesimo, octagesimo, septimo, et regnorum nostrorum anno undecimo. So he's trying to basically do both. Um, these signal and describe its unusual method and sign of validation. In addition to authentication by the Great Seal, the document also bears a notarial sign and attestation as described. So what he was saying is, in witness whereof, we have commanded our present letters to be written here, uh, here within, into the form of a public instrument by a notary public, and to be proclaimed. And we have had it confirmed by the affixing of our Great Seal. So here's the... Uh, a detail of the notarial mark. Uh, with this change, the English Chancery has made its final ratification into a universal record, imbricating the different practices of author and recipient, but also the conventions of public and private, and the impressed and inscribed images as modes of validation. So inscribed as in the notarial mark on the surface of the page, impressed as in the seal. So these two different practices and ways of authenticating a document are both combined here. Uh, and then what I'm showing you is the, um, I'm showing you here the notarial mark. So this is from the notary John de Boulogne, and he's the same notary whose mark appeared on uh, the treaty's articles of agreement, which I showed you earlier. So you can see them both here. Um, Although his attestation notes that he holds his position of notary public by apostolic authority, this signum incorporates imagery, and I'm interested, I suppose, in, in some people's responses to this, actually, because I'm not entirely uh, sure how to interpret it. Um, it's, it's somewhat unusual. I've looked at a number of notarial uh, symbols from this period. Um, so it incorporates imagery that is heraldic rather than sacred. Very often they have sort of um, most Eucharistic symbols, um, and specifically reminiscent of Richard's own personal iconography. Um, John de Boulogne's mark of a crown stag in a diamond with three fleur-de-lis fleur terminals and a lower expanded terminal bearing his name actually incorporates more of the king's personal imagery than his own great seal, which was actually Edward III's Bretigny seal with a recarved legend. The full signum, uh, as you can see, is visible on the Articles of Agreement here. Um, and on the ratification, you can see the plica partially obscures it. Um, al along with the last line of the attestation. 
as the execution of the two forms of, of authentication followed the order described in the document, notarial mark and attestation, folding, sealing with the great seal. Although notaries public had, long, uh, had by this time long since gained a foothold uh, here, England, as uh, many have noted, still remained the land of the seal. Uh, notarial instruments never became as widespread, nor did notaries ever play a central and administrative and even social role as they had for centuries in the notarial cultures of Southern Europe. Notarial practices had a more long-standing and important place in Portuguese documentation, although there too, these changed and developed over the course of this period, particularly the complex relationship between the ecclesiastical and lay public spheres. Yet Portuguese royal charters did not conventionally bear notarial attestations either. Rather, they bore the king's seal and sign manual, like the example I showed you earlier. So that is to say, his seal and, and signature. Uh, so Richard's ratification does not, in fact, mimic the conventions exactly of its recipient chancery either, at least in terms of its format. However, what I would argue is that on a deeper or structural level, the document does conform to the conventions of Portuguese royal charters in that it has both inscribed and impressed signs of authentication. This too represents a departure from the rules of domestic public records. Not only notarial practices, but graphic symbols more generally figure far less in English documentary practices than in those of continental Europe. So with this final treaty ratification, the Chancery has created a kind of hybrid. Textually, it's an inspeximus by letters patent. Formally, it's a notarized royal charter to be confirmed, muniri, by the impression of the great seal, but proclaimed, publicari, through its inscription as a public instrument. <coughs> In this instance, the diplomatic ascetic, as I've called it, has produced neither an English nor a Portuguese document, but one that invokes an idea of universality. So my second example is uh, somewhat briefer, but I think also will make a number of, uh, of these points, uh, will elucidate a number of these points. So the Treaty of Troyes, is another episode in late medieval diplomacy for which ratification documents survive on both sides. These again both take the form of royal charters and letters patent, both of large format, however they differ from one another in both their textual and visual languages, and again they are combinations of each party's chancery conventions. So the French document, which is here, um, is written in French in a current hand, leaving no vertical space for an initial, rather at as you can see, the scribe has left uh, spaces within the top line alone. So I think it's actually quite hard to see because it's document is not in great condition. But there's no sort of, sp the scribe hasn't left a space here for an initial to be filled in. There's simply <coughs> space just on the top line for some decorative uh, writing. So in these spaces, you can see a bit better in this detail, the words Charles and Perpetuel appear in large Gothic display script with intricate strap work composing the back of the C, as well as decorating ascenders throughout the top line. Within the body of the document, a more subdued display script calls attention to the initial words of clauses uh, from the confirmed articles of agreement. The document is then sealed in green wax on red and green silk cords. You can see a detail of the seal here, which does survive, although not in fantastic condition. Um, for the English ratification, the document scribe writes in Latin and adopts a more constructed treatment of script. Uh, here too, the initial words of the treaty's clauses stand out in textualis display script. So that's these, initial words of clauses, uh, about two, uh, sorry, um, and the space in the top line has been left for the king's name as well as for the first letters to each word in the royal style. Um, the king's uh, name, yes, is in Gothic display script, and uh, there's also a penwork initial A, which is a fictive scroll in grisaille, about four lines high. Um, so here, in contrast to the other ratification, the scribe has left space for an initial letter, you can see there, of, uh, of five lines with an outward curve at the right to accommodate the bow of the H. Uh, the elaborate letter, in ink alone, but very fine, so the m one of the sort of most 
artistically um, significant ones uh, that we've seen from this period. Um, so it more than fills the space and it expands out into the upper and left margin. The document has been sealed with the great seal in dark green wax and attached on a braided cord of brown silk. The script, seal, and some aspects of the seal attachment and decoration resemble formal domestic documents, such as charters of incorporation granted to London's livery companies at around the same time. So this is uh, the Draper's Charter, um, which was actually produced under the supervision of the same Clark. Um, however, this is much less, uh, much less formal, even though it has very beautiful script. Uh, and this, you can see compared the this is from the Trois ratification, and this is from the Merchant Tailors Charter, um, and that it also has, as you can see, the sort of crowned detail on the top of the H, um, and the the again the treaty ratification is more elaborate. Uh, the Charter of Incorporation has the legend souveraine, and the treaty has the words fides, pax, and justicia. So what I've emphasized so far is the idea of conflation of conventions in the document as a whole, reaching toward a kind of universality, a universal language of visual communication. To give just another very brief example, um, I want to talk about a document that will lead me back to some of the general principles that I discussed initially. Uh, and just to show you, I'm going to show you something, a different document first sort of by way of comparison. Um, so this is a Castilian document. Uh, from the 14th century, and the Castilian Chancery had one of the best uh, articulated hierarchies of Chancery conventions. They had really sort of worked this out, um, and here's sort of one example of what their most formal, sort of their royal privileges looked like. Um, here, <coughs> also 14th century, as a charter sealed by Henry of Castile for Charles VI of France. Its script, format, and decorative vocabulary follow French conventions rather than their own. Um, it then bears a notarial attestation, which we've discussed, and then the leaden bulla of uh, Castile Leon is appended on a silken cord. Um, so it looks completely different from the charters that would have been issued uh, within its own jurisdiction, but one thing is the same. And what I want to use this document to do is to bring us back to the idea of the exchanged image the discussions of portraitures as, di as diplomatic gifts that have been so important and I think significant in some of the art historical literature, not of this period and not of these kinds of objects, but of paintings in the 17th century, of you know, luxury objects exchanged between Byzantium and the West or Byzantium and Islamic lands in the earlier Middle Ages. Um, what I want to suggest here is that uh, a treaty ratification is a kind of diplomatic gift. And like the objects that other scholars have talked about, it also involves an exchanged image in the form of the seal. Perhaps one might say that the portraits exchanged in other contexts are kinds of treaty, or that the treaty is a kind of portrait, uh, in the sense that all of these things are part of what I've broadly described as uh, a diplomatic aesthetic. So that is my, yes, that is all I have to say. Um, but I'm happy to take questions about any of this or to return to any of the examples. Oh, yes, this is the Treaty of Maastricht, 1992, so a topical subject. 